so much for everything you're doing. Um, you know, every time a piece of news comes out, I just want to hear what you have to say about it. So I'm looking for you on every station that has you. And I thank you for everything you're doing in New York State for bringing data to uh, take on the New York State uh, governor uh, for taking uh, this, the heroes of the pandemic and turning them out onto the street because they weren't My obeying name is Brian. Uh, this ridiculous uh, draconian method of trying to vaccinate the, uh, every healthcare worker, which we have seen in the data suggests that we are totally not doing uh, right by them and not just giving proper precautions would have been enough. And they've lost their jobs. They've had to leave the state. And thank you for all the extra things that God put you here to do. I feel like we are blessed to know you and have you amongst us. So thank you so much for your help every day. Thank you. Uh, Gert, are you able to get on uh, your co-host? So just turn yourself on and we look forward to seeing you. Can you, can you unmute yourself? I can hear you. If you can hear me, uh, you're fine. All right, great. We have you and uh, you, you take it away. Thanks so much. Gert, you, people don't know you. I, we, uh, the world that I know, uh, all we do is talk about you. But please, just briefly, um, tell them about your history for a moment, a minute or two. It could be the whole 15 minutes just on your history and virology and, and your work. But then let's get to the reason why we're at a critical moment with all the world leaders telling us that we need to, the only way out of this is the vaccine, why that is so dangerously wrong, and about how antibiotic resistance is so similar to this vaccine resistance that we're creating right now. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, I'll uh, keep it uh, brief. Uh, my background is uh, vaccinology and virology. I'm a seasoned vaccinologist. I've worked in, uh, in industry, vaccine industry. I've worked with uh, global uh, health organizations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and uh, uh, Gavi. Uh, I'm a vaccine researcher uh, taking deep dive in the design of uh, novel vaccines. Uh, I was also deeply involved in uh, fighting the Ebola crisis a number of years ago in West Africa. And basically what I've been uh, studying in this pandemic is primarily the impact of the mass vaccination campaigns on the evolutionary capacity of the virus. So that means, does the mass vaccination have an impact on the way the virus is evolving and trying to escape from the immune pressure that we are putting, an immune pressure that we are generating by mass vaccination, of course. So uh, to put things very straight and simple, we have been developing vaccines that uh, targeted, in fact, protection against disease, okay? And that protection against this disease was, the goal was to achieve that protection against disease by generating neutralizing antibodies that would protect against disease, but that we know cannot protect against infection. So because these antibodies cannot protect against infection, they enable the virus to overcome the immune pressure that we are putting on the infectiousness of the virus. And that has resulted in the dominant propagation of more infectious variants. We have seen alpha, beta, gamma, delta. We now have Omicron, which is highly infectious. But that is not, that is not the, the, uh, the end. We have also seen that now that uh, Omicron is resistant to the neutralizing antibodies. So we have been generating vaccines that induce neutralizing antibodies. And now we have come to a stage where Omicron is completely resistant towards these neutralizing antibodies. So now we, are, we continue nevertheless, we continue nevertheless this mass vaccination because now we are targeting no longer disease, but we are targeting severe disease and hospitalization. And we achieve this to some extent by the fact that the vaccines are now primarily inducing non-neutralizing antibodies. The neutralizing capacity of the vaccines is gone. We know that the virus is resistant to the neutralizing antibodies, but these vaccines also induce non-neutralizing antibodies. Now, some brilliant scientists have shown that these non-neutralizing antibodies are responsible 
for protecting against severe disease, but again, they don't protect against infection. So they allow the virus to continue to replicate and to infect. And guess what? Similar to the first phase of the pandemic, where the virus has been able to overcome the mass pressure, the mass pressure that we were putting on the infectiousness, we are now putting a massive pressure on the virus, on the virulence of the virus. The virulence is the capacity to cause severe and uh, to provoke severe disease. And it is very clear, and I've been, you know, in a manifesto of 45 pages, I've been describing how at a molecular level, the virus will manage to overcome that new massive immune pressure that we are putting, no longer through the neutralizing antibodies, but now through the non-neutralizing antibodies. So basically what I'm saying here is all of the vaccines that we are using are basically just driving the evolutionary capacity of the virus without, without preventing the infection or the transmission of the virus. If you don't have an impact on the viral infectiousness or on viral transmission, you can, for God's sake, never generate herd immunity. If you cannot generate herd immunity, then you cannot end the pandemic. This is in sharp contrast to what natural immunity would do, because natural immunity, thanks to the innate branch of the immune system, and the naturally acquired antibodies can generate sterilizing immunity, can diminish transmission, can generate herd immunity, and can therefore end the pandemic. So as long as we continue these mass vaccination campaigns, we will, we will be increasing the infection rate in the population. When we do this, of course, all people who are vaccinated and have non-neutralizing antibodies will see the non-neutralizing antibodies boosted. These boosted non-neutralizing antibodies will exert more and more pressure on viral virulence, on its capacity to cause severe disease. And basically, just like the, vaccine, the, the virus did in the face in the first phase of the pandemic, when it overcame the pressure on infectiousness, it will overcome the pressure on viral virulence. And that is where my fear is. And I'm convinced that if we do not intervene in a smart way, we will end up with viral variants that are not only highly infectious, but also highly virulent and completely resistant to the vaccines. And so by on top immunizing our children, for example, children have a strong innate immunity, but it is not trained. So that means it can easily by, be outcompeted by the vaccinal antibodies, but the vaccinal antibodies don't work anymore. So that means that we are depriving children from their immune defense against the variants, thereby also preventing them to generate herd immunity, which all in all is just a catastrophic uh, situation. And um, so I think, and uh, I'll stop there, that uh, with these mass vaccinations, we are heading to a very, very dangerous place. And what we would need to do is to replace these mass vaccination campaigns by mass antiviral campaigns so that we can diminish the infectivity rate in the population. When we diminish the infectivity rate, we will diminish the likelihood that people who are sitting on these non neutralizing antibodies that they boost the, the titers of these antibodies all the time. And so by doing that, if we boost this, the, inf the immune pressure will of course increase. So if we don't reduce this infectious pressure in the population, which is linked to the immune pressure, then the virus will simply diminish the immune pressure by eliminating that part of the population that is exerting this immune pressure. And as I was saying, the immune pressure is exerted by the non-neutralizing vaccinal antibodies. So thanks for having me, I'll stop there. Kurt, stay with us for a few seconds. I have a couple of questions. One of the things that you noticed when uh, what happened in Israel was that the, um, the graph kept on going up and down like a wave. What are you seeing in the waves right now with the Omicron variant? Are we, besides infectious rate, 
are we now going to head into this very dangerous new wave that you're speaking about in this variant or variant very close to it based on the pattern of what you've seen in the past? Because it seems like the wave goes up and down and it's getting larger recently. Uh, can you explain a little bit of that? So what we see generally in highly vaccinated countries is that we have now a sequence of waves, larger waves, smaller waves. But it's, what is very characteristic is that before, for example, the beginning of the pandemic, these waves, when they declined, they were joining the baseline again. Now, when you see these waves declining, they are no longer joining the baseline. They decline and then they level up into a, a kind of a, a plateau. And then immediately th there is the next wave that's, that, that is starting. So the interval also between the waves has become smaller and smaller. The frequency of the waves has increased. The waves are, when declining, no longer joining the baseline. And so what you're seeing right now is with the more infectious members of the Omicron family, you have, of course, each time a kind of flare up because the new variant, the new member of the Omicron, the BA4 or 5, is more infectious and it will start the next wave. But all in all, what this is demonstrating is that we have a high transmission still going on in the population, a high level of infection still going on in the population. Because remember, right now, the infection rate is tremendously underestimated because there is a lot of people who are having mild infections, asymptomatic or moderate infections. But people know that uh, Omicron is, 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 is not that dangerous, so many of them don't go to the hospital, don't even go to, uh, to see their medical doctor. And the number of cases is largely underestimated. Never the underreported, nevertheless, we are still seeing a lot of activity in these highly vaccinated countries in terms of waves, in terms of the frequency of the waves, in terms of shorter intervals, in terms of, of uh, uh, declines that do no longer rejoin, join the baseline, which all demonstrates that there is high infection rate, high transmission, and that the pandemic is full blown that it is fully that it is is going on. It's just that the non-neutralizing antibodies that exert pressure on the virulence, they are still for the time being, but that situation is extremely unstable. But for the time being, they are just still preventing, in the vast majority of the cases, uh, hospitalizations and severe disease. But that will definitely change because the virus is replicating, the virus is transmitting and the virus will escape immune pressure. We have seen it during the first part of the pandemic, how easily it was escaping the immune pressure that we were in and variants that were more and more infectious all the way up to, to Omicron. So as we, as, so our, our, the closest analogy that most people would understand this as would be that when you're taking an antibiotic, I know it's a different viruses and bacteria are different, but most people understand and what a Mercer infection is, something that is resistant to antibody to, to antibiotics. Is this a similar, even though it's different and the epidemiology is different and we're talking about a different organism, is it not antibiotic resistant, somewhat saying vaccine resistant that, because it seems to me when we heard Dr. Offit from the Philadelphia Children's Hospital say, oh, we'll just create another vaccine, which I heard him say when interviewed, how ridiculous is that without safety studies, without all the things necessary to keep the human race safe, that we're just going to create a way out of it or vaccine, vaccinate our way out of it. And that's what seems to be what this prime minister is saying. How wrong is that? Really? Yeah. How wrong is that? Well, you're asking two questions. I will provide two answers. First of all, uh, can you still hear me? Because I uh, lost the, uh, the image here. Can you still uh, hear me? I'm looking. I'm looking. I hear you, but I'm trying to see what happened here. Connection error. One second. I hear you, but I don't see you. Hold on. Retry. Loading your whiteboard experience. I don't know what that means, but. Uh, uh, that might, might not be. Hold on. But if you can me. still hear me, can you still hear yes, me? Let's, yeah, let's still hear you. I'll try to reconnect yeah. you somehow. Okay, give me a go. Speak. Yes. No. So, first of all, well, I, I must say that it is a shame that uh, virologists or vaccinologists like Ovid uh, talk this type of, of nonsense. Why? Well, even if you come with a new vaccine, the non-neutralizing antibodies that I was talking about, 
they are directed, they are targeted against a part of the spike protein that is not within the receptor binding domain, that is not within the variable epitopes of the receptor binding domain, these non neutralizing antibodies are directed against a very conserved part of the spike protein. So any new type of spike protein will have this highly conserved part. So as soon as you inject those vaccines, the first thing that will happen is that you will have a tremendous recall of the non neutralizing antibodies because these non neutralizing antibodies have been primed by the previous vaccine. Right, so the non-neutralizing antibodies will start to dominate, and 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 that is what is exerting the immune pressure, and so therefore it is completely wrong what he's saying that you could mitigate the situation by a new vaccine. The comparison with the antibiotics is very very relevant, but remember, a bacterium can replicate on its own, and you would put the bacterium on a medium that has, for example, an antibiotic. So during the time where this bacterium is replicating, this antibiotic will be in the medium all the time and will be able to exert pressure on this bacterium. And of course, if there is mutants that can escape that pressure, they will start to gain a competitive advantage and dominate. So what is the difference with viruses? Well, the difference is almost none. The only difference is that a virus needs to replicate in a living organism, in living cells. So if your body has antibodies, that is the environment. That is, you know, the antibodies are like the antibiotics, right? They, they, they are also directed here against the virus. Antibiotics, the similar uh, component in the environment of the virus are the, uh, the antibodies. But when the virus now is transmitted from one person to the other, you could say, oh, it's going to another medium. The antibiotics are no longer there. It's, it is, you know, transferred to, the virus is transferred to another medium, another person. Yeah, that is true. But provided this very person also has the same hostile environment of immune antibodies, it is like the medium had remained the same. The hostile environment has remained the same. And that is how the virus, just like the bacterium, will be able, despite the fact that it is using living cells, will be able to select mutants that are more infectious, provided, of course, that you have the large parts of the population that are, so to say, offering or confronting the virus with the same hostile environment. And that is exactly what mass vaccination does, of course. It generates a hostile environment in large parts of the population. So even when the virus jumps from one person to the other, it's like it is staying all the time in this hostile environment, like the bacterium on the medium with the antibiotic. This is, I think, one of the most important issues of our time. And uh, I really believe that this is something that not, must not be overlooked for humanity. And I'm sorry that it's become politicized. Thank you so much, Gert, for really being the leader in explaining this. And hopefully the governments will listen when people stand up enough and they have the information in which to, uh, to empower them. And I know that you have two things that we're gonna get out to everyone that you have presented in the chat. And we'll make sure that it goes out to all the people here and as well as to uh, our website that we're going to set up at the end of the Zoom today. So thank you so much, Gert, for all you're doing and for all your efforts. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Robert.